Apparently, Mushu has kids. Did not know this, so he's dealing with that. Right. I was surprised too. Yeah. Uh, that's his problem. All right. Um, so the midterm exam uh, that we did before the break. Uh, by the way, fall break was awesome. I, I'm glad they started doing this. Um, yeah, of course, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I didn't do anything like. Huh? Oh, do you think? Yeah. So it's good for everyone. All right. So the midterm exam, uh, the graded ones are in my office. Everyone should have gotten a notification, I think, on Gradescope. But it's also your score is posted on Canvas. Um, as I said in the email, uh, the numbers look uh, as you know, as expected in previous years, or compared to previous years. So this is, uh, this is the distribution for this class, and then this is last year. Uh, so it's actually better than last year. Looks, looks more correct, in my opinion, right? More normal, right? So uh, some of you emailed and said, hey, you know, like, it didn't do as well on the midterm. Like, they're freaking out. And there's a project-based course. So if, if you understand where you're going with the projects, uh, that's probably the most important thing. All right, so then the, uh, the checkpoint two for, for the project two is due tomorrow. Uh, and then again, post some Piazza if you have questions about this. And then project three will be out. It's actually out now, but we'll cover that uh, in class on Thursday. OK, any questions? For project three, there will be actually a reference solution. That kid, Chi, uh, is amazing. Uh, he, made a, he compiled bus tub into, into Wasm, so you can run it in your browser. Yes? I, the question is, what's the difficulty compared to Project Two? I mean, again, somebody asked this before. Like, depends on like if your C plus is getting better, your debugging skill is getting better. You should understand a little bit more about going a bus tub. It, I don't know, it's tough to say. It should be easier because you're getting better, not because the project's made easier. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. His question is, how important it is in project, for project three and four that everything works correctly in project two. Project three will be, it's implementing query executors. So you would need your index to do an index scan and index nested loop join. But you can still do a sequential scan without your index working correctly. So that, yeah, there'll be some things you can do without it. But I, I, the buffer pool is probably the more, more important thing to make sure that's working correctly. All right, so we have a lot of, to cover today because it's, um, this is a, a condensed, what would have been two classes on query optimization and query planning into one. Uh, let's see how this goes. Um, I'll say up, up front too also that the query optimization is the one thing on databases that I know the least about. Uh, what's that? Sorry. Because it's hard, right? It's very, very, very hard. Uh, and I mean, so I'll, I'll cover the things that like, again, we'll cover the things. That, we're going to go a bit deeper than what the textbook goes into, because I think there's more things that they actually discuss that, that are worth discussing. Um, but I say again, oftentimes when we invite outside speakers, I try to get them to talk about the query optimizer, because this is, to me, this is one of those interesting parts, because it's, it's the black magic of a database system. right? So up until now, we've been all saying, hey, we've got this, this SQL query shows up. We want to parse it, convert it into some kind of plan, a logical plan. And then we want to generate a physical plan that we can ex execute it. And I've been making some uh, noise about how, oh, be, the, the, the database system is in a better position to figure out what's the optimal query plan uh, than some Joe Schmo programmer writing it themselves. So that's what this class is really all about. And that now is actually how are we going to find this optimal plan, right? So for a given SQL query, the query optimizer's job is to find a correct execution plan that has the lowest cost. Now, I've underlined correct, meaning it has to be the answer that they actually want, right? It doesn't doesn't help us to find a really fast plan if it produces the wrong results. People get pissed, right? Um, but the term cost I'm putting in quotes because the cost is this relative term that can mean diff different things for different people. Um, for the purposes of this class, we'll assume cost means the, the one that runs the fastest. But obviously, you can imagine other scenarios where you maybe want to have that cost be reducing the number of network messages, reducing the, uh, you know, the energy usage, and things like that, right? So we'll talk about how we're going to uh, generate this cost in general, or ge generate this cost in a different, bunch of different ways. And as I said, this is going to be the hardest part of a database system. Right? This is what's going to separate the very expensive commercial systems, the Oracles, the SQL servers, the DB2s, Teradatas, Snowflakes, versus like the random stuff you're going to find on GitHub or even some really good open source systems like MySQL and Postgres and SQLite. 
right? Because uh, you know those companies have spent decades and millions and millions of dollars trying to make their query optimizer, uh, you know, handle all these different situations and be as intelligent as possible. Uh, and that's something just the open source guys can't can't compete against. Right. Yes. The statement is, isn't it because open source, anybody can contribute to it, uh, and therefore, hypothetically, should be better. How many people are out there know query optimization, right? So I would say, my second line here says, if you're good at this, you'll get paid money. So when the database companies email me and say, hey, we want to hire your students, the number one thing they ask for is, oh, by the way, do you have anybody that does query optimization, right? And for a while, we were building our own query optimizers, so I had some students, but now we're not. So we don't, I don't have any students that are building query optimizers. It's pretty much the Germans, right? Like, that's it. And then these old white guys, like you know, from the '60s and '70s, right? It's been you know, this has been a really hard problem, and up until recently, this is not something that that the open source community has really uh, tackled. It's sort of been patchwork good enough, right? And again, Oracle has billions. They have a whole floor in their palace in Redwood City that was just just doing query optimization. You know, Postgres and MySQL can't can't, can't compete with that. OK, so the other thing to point out, too, is that, uh, well, this, as I said, it's proven to be incomplete to find the optimal plan. So we have to try to figure out a way to quickly to find something that's good enough. Um, and so no optimizer for any possible query, despite being called an optimizer, is not, is not going to find the optimal plan. right? Because MP complete, it's, just, it's impossible. For simple things like select star for table A equal, you know, ID equals something, that's easy. We'll find the optimal plan. But once you start doing joins, then, then things become a mess. So the technique we're going to use to be able to, to trim down the, the number of possible query plans we have to look at is basically using heuristics and other, uh, other assumptions about what the database system is going to do to try to get us to uh, something that's good enough. And this cost, I would say, also, too, is going to be an internal metric. Right? This is not going to be like spit out the expected wall clock time, because that's going to be very difficult to predict. And the cost that you would generate for maybe one query plan in Postgres that cost is not comparable against a, you know, an internal cost model from MySQL or, or Oracle. Right? These are internal values. Yes. So with like how far deep learning has gone, has come, like how much iteration? All right. So statement is uh, we take this offline. Uh, deep learning is a thing. Uh, are people considering using deep learning for query optimization? Yes. Uh, in limited scenarios, we can come back to that later. That's something we'll cover in the advanced class. Not here. Right? You, have, you, have, you have to walk before you run. Like, deep learning is great, but it's not going to like, you know, if you don't have a cost model, then it doesn't matter. Right? All right. So I've talked about this before. We talked about the difference between a logical plan and a physical plan. I just want to say the logical plan, again, is going to be the high level description of what we want to do. I want to scan a table. And then the physical operator, the physical plan, will, will represent the exact execution algorithm or method we're going to use to do that logical operation. So, it's, so the logical would be scan table foo. The physical would be use an index scan on this particular index for, for foo. Right? And then there's that query processing model we talked about before. Where you have the operator execution, whether it's vectorized or iterator model. Those are the manifestations of a, a physical execution, a physical operator. So in some cases, uh, we will have to care about what the physical uh, layout or the format of the data that we're producing, in particular the sort order, because that will determine what we need to do potentially up above in the query plan. Like if we have an order by and we use a sort merge join and we're already sorted, then maybe we don't need to do the order by. So this means that we're not always going to have a one-to-one -one mapping between the number of logical operators, and the, number, uh, the logical operators and the physical operators. A logical operator can be broken up into multiple physical operators, and or it could be you know condensed down into another one, to a, to a single physical operator with with others, right? All right. So here's a high-level overview of what the execution path is going to look like for when a query shows up in our database system. We ask some application, PHP, Java, Python, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, they send us a SQL query. And the first thing we can potentially hit would be in our system is a SQL rewriter. And I say this is optional or rare. Not all systems are actually going to do this. This is literally taking the SQL string that shows up over the wire, over the message, and doing some kind of regular expression to convert it into a, another SQL string. Some systems do this, like uh, the test, for example, the, the my, clustered MySQL out of YouTube, right? They do basically regex and do some basic rewriting. Um, and it's basically thinking like if I see if I see a unique table name, uh, instead of me instead of like you know select from table foo, 
I maybe come up, I'll rename it to like foo one, right? Because internally that means something different uh, for the system. Like I said, th this is this is not that common. Most systems don't do this. All right, so now we take our SQL query, we throw it into our parser. This is going to spit out an abstract syntax tree, or just the tokens that we see in the SQL string. And then we're going to pass it to what is called the binder. Um, some systems have different names for this. Uh, but the basic idea is that we're going to take these tokens that we have in our abstract syntax tree and actually map them now to internal database objects. right? So we have to look in the catalog and say, oh, we know that there's a, a from clause followed by some, some string. So we go look at our catalog and say, you know, is, is this string actually a table name? If yes, then we get back the, like, the internal ID for that. Right? So when you ever see like table not found or column doesn't exist, they're doing this step in, in the binder phase. Then next step is you would have a, now what is a logical plan, basically it's almost a conversion of the, again, the syntax tree now with the annotations of the objects in the, in the catalog. And you can pass this now to our tree rewriter. Again, this is optional. Uh, like this is operating directly on the, on the logical plan. Not all systems do this, but most of them do. Bus tub is not going to do this. Bus tub is going to go directly from the binder output into a, a physical plan for simplicity reasons. And for this one also too, we can go back to the, the catalog and get additional schema information to find things like, uh, you know, what are the primary keys? What are the foreign keys? What are the type information that we would have on the, uh, on, on our, on our query plan? All right, and this can then have a new logical plan that we then shove out into our optimizer. I'm going to use the term optimizer in this uh, lecture. Uh, old school database people will call it compiler. I think Snowflake calls theirs a compiler because it's back in the days in the 70s when they first proposed, hey, let's take something like SQL or, relation or declarative query language and convert it to a query plan. That was when like C uh, was and Unix, like back in the early 1970s, was a hot thing. And this idea of like, I'm going to build a C compiler was this, you know, this this uh, far-fetched idea at the time, um, which is now super commonplace, but the idea was the same thing. The same way you'd have a C compiler, you'd have a SQL compiler. But I'll use the term optimizer. Sometimes it'll say the planner. It's basically the same thing. All right, so now for this optimizer, uh, we get additional information from the, from the catalog, but we're also now going to have this thing called a cost model that's going to be used for us, that's going to allow us to be able to predict the estimated execution costs of, of a particular query plan. And the idea is that we can potentially enumerate over a bunch of different, different possible plans, uh, and we'll see two different ways to do that, and then pick the one that has, has the, the lowest expected cost. And then you produce a physical plan that you can then execute in the engine. Okay? Yes? The tree rewriter, the tree rewriter is, is doing uh, manipulation of the logical plan to a new logical plan. We'll see examples in a second. Question over here? Okay, all right, so again, this is a high level overview of how every, every system that has, takes SQL in and does something. Uh, and like I said, the, re, the SQL writing and the tree writing, these don't always, um, not all systems have these. And then so some optimizers, the primitive ones, they actually won't have a cost model. They'll just use like hard-coded rules, which is what basically BusTub is doing, right? If then else clauses or, or pattern matching to say, if I see you know, one operator followed by another operator uh, within some context, maybe I can rewrite it the query in a different way. But at this point on the, on the, this point in the path, we're, we're manipulating a query plan tree, not the raw SQL. Yes? Does this diagram show a cost-based optimizer? Rather yeah, that, that, that's what this is. So, okay, so for a rule-based optimizer, it doesn't Yeah, this question is, is like, is this an example of a cost-based optimizer? Yes. If it's a rule-based optimizer, you just get rid of the, the, whatever this, this calculator thing that I, that I showed there. Okay, so that sort of takes us to what the, the, the high level thing we're talking about today is how we can do query optimization. So there's there can be heuristics and rules that we can do sort of basic things without having a cost model, without, uh, without having some logic to evaluate, hey, is this the right thing to do for this query given my data? Um, it's sort of things that you always want to do. Uh, you may need to go look at the catalog and say, okay, is this, you know, is this, is this query operating on this kind of table that has this different type? A specific type, and therefore I need to do certain things, and that some rules apply, some rules don't apply, right? At the end of the day, you're not looking at, at the data, right? And then the, the more sophisticated method is going to be a cost based search. As I said, we're going to use a model to enumer enumerate over a bunch of different possible plans, 
that are equivalent that produce the same correct result, and we pick the one that has the, the lowest cost. Yes? Uh, for something like enjoin, you should always put like the smaller chip on the outside. Does that count as solution? So this question, the statement is, for something like join, would you put something always on the, the sorry, the, would you always want to put the, since you always want to put the smaller table on, on the outer table, be the outer table, does that count as a cost-based search or heuristic search? Yeah. That would be like a rule, right? So you would go to the catalog and say, what's the expected cardinality of, of this table? Oh, OK. So the catalog reports like the Yeah, the catalog maintain. We'll talk about statistics in a second, yes. The catalog will, will be a place where you can get some additional, uh, additional information. Okay. All right, so we're going to first talk about the, the heuristic and rule-based optimization. Then we'll talk about some query cost models. And again, these are high-level concepts. And then we'll finish up talking about the uh, top-down and bottom-up uh, cost-based optimization searches. All right. All right, so the logical plan stuff we talked about before. This is I'm just repeating myself here. Uh, but the idea is that we're going to transform, again, this logical plan into a new logical plan using these pattern matching rules. That you can think of like this could be implemented with like a visitor pattern where you're traversing down the query plan uh, and you're trying to identify what's the operator that I'm looking at, what's my children, what's my parent, and then maybe you can then rewrite the, the tree into a, then into a new tree, right? The idea here is that the, the some rules we always want to do, therefore you, you, we want to apply these rules, uh, but then if we're also doing a cost-based search, um, we want to be able to maybe guide the, the, the cost-based search to consider query plans where we know it's probably going to be the right, the right choice, or the, the optimal choice, and not look at stupid things, right? Because then you have sort of the cost-based search could just blindly enumerate over everything brute force, and it would take a lot longer. So the idea is like to cut that, that time down, we can use these logical plan optimizations to sort of shortcut or throw away things we know that's never going to be a good choice for us, right? So we're not going to be able to compare plans before and after the manipulation or before and after the, the change. It's, again, these are codified rules that say, we know this is the right thing to do. Therefore, we're always going to want to do it, assuming that the rule matches, right? So I'm going to go through sort of a one quick example. We'll go through sort of four steps. Again, this is a, again, a gross approximation of what, what will happen in, uh, in, in a database system. So say we have a query here that is, uh, we want to find all of the, the artist that appears on uh, my mixtape. As you recall back from the, I think the first lecture, we had this, this Spotify uh, database. We have artists. Artists appear on, on albums. Right? It appears as the foreign key reference between al uh, album and artist, so that an artist can appear on multiple albums. So in the first step here, we want to split the conjunctive predicates. So in our where clause, we see that we have a bunch of ands, right? Artist ID equals appears on artist ID and so forth, right? So instead of having that just be one giant uh, filter operation in, in, re in relation to algebra, we're going to break this up into separate, uh, st separate uh, where clauses, or se separate predicates. Right? And we don't want to be able to do this because we, we can then manipulate and move them around as, as needed. The also thing I point out, too, is that th we're going basically from a literal translation of the, of the SQL query into our original plan here. Right? So we're, since, since we know we need to do, do a join, but we don't know what kind of join we want to do yet, we're just doing a Cartesian product. But we know that's going to be stupid, so we'll fix that later. And then the, uh, the order in which we're doing the joins is just the, the order that they appear in the SQL query. Because often, you know, because it comes, you know, as, as you parse it, you just see the order that they appear, and you start joining them together, right? Uh, for, this is easy to do for conjunctions. For ors, you, you basically have to duplicate the expressions, right? So that we can move things around. All right, so next, thing, next optimization we can do is predicate pushdown. Right? And the idea here is that we want to filter as much data as, as, we, as soon as possible in our query plan. Uh, so we're going to push the predicates down to the lowest point where, it's, uh, where we have enough information to actually apply the predicate. Right? So with all the, pre all the predicates up here, all the filters up here, we're basically doing complete sequential scans on these, these three tables. And then doing the Cart Cartesian product, which is the worst, worst thing to do. Right, so now in our, in our rules, we could then examine what's actually in the expression and find anyone that does not require, uh, uh, you know, find the point in the, in the query plan where we have, again, enough information coming into it that we can apply the predicate. So, so for example, here, this predicate album.name equals Andy's OG mix. Well, I could put it right after the scan here because I don't, it doesn't reference any other column in my predicate. So therefore, this is the lowest point I could put that. 
right? And you would end up something like this. In the case of this one here, again, because it's referencing both the artist and the peers table, uh, I have to do it af after the join. All right, so now we're going to replace the Cartesian products with inner joins. And we're going to attach then the, the join predicates that are right above the Cartesian product to be what we're actually going to do the join with, uh, on, right? So it's sort, of, it's sort of obvious here, like artist ID equals appears, appears that artist ID. Well, I can replace this with the inner join and have the join clause, the on clause of the join, be now this predicate, right? And I, I would do the same thing for the other one up there. All right, so then the last optimization we can apply, or transformation we can apply, is do projection pushdown. The idea here is that we want to re remove uh, all the redundant attributes th that we would need or th that are being generated from each different operator at the lowest point of the tree so that we're not passing around data that we know we don't, we don't need to produce in our output. All right, this is assuming that, that it's a row store or, or we're doing late materialization, so we're actually copying tuples, the, 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 all the values of the tuple, uh, from one operator to the next, even if they don't need it. So we'll push down the projection like this. Right, it's a bit complicated here, but in the case of artists, we only we know that up above in the query plan, we only need the ID and the name column. So we'll do that projection here. Same thing for peers. Uh, and then after the join, we only need the name and the album ID like that. Right? Yes? So his statement is, uh, his question is, if you do, if you're very aggressive on the projection pushdown, would that require you to uh, end up storing more intermediate results uh, and therefore blow out your memory? Is that what you're basically saying? Yeah, like, so, yeah. like, 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 example, why, when you do like the, the bottom left uh, at, at equal join, what, what's, the, what's the value of first making a, a thing that has just what you want from those two versus reading from those two directly into the equal join? Yes. So, so yes, yeah, so the question is, and it's, it's a good question, it's a good point, um, that it may be the case here that if I'm just feeding this directly into this join, that rather than having an intermediate operator where I actually do the projection, materialize that, then do the join, it w w might be better off to just pass the, the full tuple in here then do a projection, right? Because you're not you don't have an intermediate step. Or just like when you're when like when that one is reading into the one below it, just have it while it's reading only just read the ones you want along the way, no intermediate storage. So just project while reading. Yeah, so th I'm not really showing that here. Like the physical implementation, the physical operator could be the combination of like a scan feeding into the join here, right? And, and like doing the projection as part of the scan. Okay, so the projection is not necessarily like an intermediate result. It could just be like Statement is it's not a intermediate result. It's a fancy way of reading. Again, this, these are logical operators. So like I haven't said anything about what we're actually how we're actually going to implement this. Which is logically like we can do this and throw things away. Whether or not the the, the data system decides I want to do that projection right now, it, it can it can determine based on the cost. Yes. Uh, so your question is for the for for the album table. Yeah. Should we do this? Should do the the projection on ID first? Uh, so your statement is okay. So my for, for the album here on this sort of path of the query plan, I do do the filter, then I do the projection on just ID. Could I also put a projection here and get ID name? Yeah, you could do that. Yes. Again, logically, it's correct. Does it help? It depends, it depends on the implementation, right? Yes? Uh, this kind of, I, I know this is logically, like, logical and not, like, to, uh, related to implementation, but you can just, just assume the early materialization model, because late materialization can be... Yeah, so the statement is, does, is this assuming early materialization, because late materialization, this would be unnecessary to do these projection push down. Yes, but again, I'm just trying to show that like you can do these, you could introduce these transformations, okay. right? Just, it's a type of transformation. Predicate pushdowns probably more important, right? 
there will be a query on project three where uh, you want to do projection to remove unused aggregates, right? So just things like that. Yes. So her her statement is is projection pushdown always given more like is, is it more important to do project predicate pushdown than the projection pushdown? Yes. Um, but again, like so, depending on depending on the implementation, this could just be a bunch of if then else statements, or it could be actually a rule engine that like does a pass of the query plan and does like pattern matching and has these like a, sort of a, a catalog of rules that it can apply uh, and do these transformations. And ideally, they're idempotent, right? You could, you could apply them in any different order or commutative. It doesn't matter what order you apply them. Um, some, some things that's true, not always. But like in, that, in those kind of systems, you actually can specify like priorities of the, the rule so that like this thing would get fired first before projection pushdown. Uh, as far as I know, in Postgres, it's a bunch. It's if then else. It's like hard coded. If this, then that. If this, then that. And they, that's how they they check these rules. I think my SQL does the same thing. But Cockroach, Cockroach, Cockroach DB SQL Server, they there's a type of type of um, optimizer we'll talk about at the end. And they're using a, a pattern matching engine, and they have priorities, which I think is the right way to do it. All right, I want to go how we go quickly how we do nested subqueries or nested queries, right? And there's basically two approaches, right? If you have a correlated subquery, it's where you the inner query is referencing something on the outer query. If it's uncorrelated, then the the inner query doesn't need anything on, on the outer query, and so you, you can sort of treat them in different ways. And the two approaches are going to be either to rewrite them, to correlate them, flatten them, uh, basically rewrite the nested query into a join, or you could extract out the nested query, run that in a in a separate just separately, put it into a temp table, and then either inject the scalar value if that's what's needed, or do a join against the. Um, actually, take that. Yeah, it's it's injecting because it's, it's uncorrelated. All right, so this is an example actually from the old textbook we used to use, um, which is based on sailboats. So basically, it's uh, it's a it's a reservation system. There's sailboats, and you have sailors, and people re reserve sailboats. I right, think 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 maybe car rental is a better one. A better example. So this one here, we're going to find all of the uh, the sailors that reserve something on a, a particular day, right? So the thing about here is that we see that it's a correlated subquery. So inside of the, the inner query, it's referencing the outer query. And so this where clause clearly looks like it should be a join, right? And so the data system can just rewrite this uh, into a join using a rule, right? And we can do this on a logical level because we just say, okay, we know that we have this nested query and it's referencing something in the outer query, and it's an echo join, or sorry, it's a yeah, equality predicate. So therefore, let me extract it out and rewrite it as a join. Yes. So the idea of this is kind of just creating this little like your little subtree of plans, and then that way you can kind of like combine their optimization by just doing push down as if there is no distinction between them. Your statement is: Are we treating that the query plan is a, is basically a subtree of plans? So that we can do rewriting without, sorry, what was the second part? Oh, so that just the rewriting is just kind of like doing the normal optimizations on a larger tree? Uh, you're saying, yeah, I don't really follow your question. It's like, I mean, you can have your rules either look at single, single operator uh, in isolation or like look at a series of operators and understand the context of that, that, that exists in, right? And if you match those rules, then you can tra transform the tree. Appropriately. So the, the, the concept of the rewriting thing that, that you have is like, instead of having some little black box that you're, like, that you're like, um, pulling stuff from, it's that you just have more tree in there. I don't yet. What do you mean more tree? Let's like, is, there, uh, is, is the idea then just that, like, whatever the outer query is, it's plan. Whatever it's like retrieves it from the inner query, that's just like, instead of having some black box, there's just more operations. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I understand. So yes, yeah, so his question is like, in the case of my nested query here, when I have the you know the nested part, is that just inside just more operators in the query plan itself, uh, rather than being like a function call to something else? Yeah, you you would know what the operators are within the within the, the nested query, and therefore you can manipulate them as needed, right? And obviously you can have nested queries inside of nested queries, so you just have a curse down. Yeah, so is the alternative having a black box where you pull stuff out of? I mean, it's a black box. You can't pull anything out of it because you don't know what's in there, right? Like, 
Um, all right, so this is an example of uh, de decomposing queries, which I just showed. Um, so for, for queries that are, that are, again, correlated, where you know that you can, you can easily you know, extract them out and rewrite them as a join, uh, you basically break the queries up into blocks, and you sort of tackle them uh, one by one. Um, for subqueries that are more complicated, again, you, would, you, could, you could run them separately and store the results in, in a temp table, right? So this is, a, this is a more complicated example here. We're trying to find all the sailors that reserved a, uh, a red boat, and, and they had the highest rating amongst all the sailors, right? So here we have our, our nested block. You see here that it's, a, it's uncorrelated, right? Because it's just getting the, the max rating of all the sailors. Because we're trying to find whoever, the, whoever is the highest uh, rating. You could have multiple sailors with the same highest rating, right? So in this case here, the, the stupid thing to do would be able to run this query, and for every or every tuple in the outer query, rerun this thing over and over again. But obviously, that would be wasteful. MySQL used to do this for a long, long time, until recently they, they fixed it. Um, but so instead, we'll just run this once, and then, in, and then in just insert the scalar value here. right? And in some systems, they will actually extract out the nested query first, run that uh, first, then go back into the optimizer and say, OK, well, now I know what value I should, I should put in here. Right? Uh, actually, MySQL does that, which is somewhat clever. Um, not all systems actually do that. right? In, in most cases, it would be like the easiest thing to do is, OK, check this out, store this as a variable, which you can have in SQL, and just in inject it there. But you're doing this when the, when the, when the optimizer is then, oh, sorry. If you don't run it, run it beforehand, then you just have a placeholder value, like if it's a prepared statement. You run it through the query optimizer, and you make a, a, a basic guess of what you think that's actually going to be, what the value would actually be. Right, so, then, so, so I extract out the inner block, and then I do my planning, planning on the outer block. Yes? So you can only do this when the inner block is un You can only do this when the inner block is uncorrelated. Uh, No, you could be stupid and do it for the uh, for for a correlated query, um, but you don't like you, you can you can convert it to a join if it's correlated, and ideally you, you want to try to do that, but it's it's hard. Okay. All right. So let's now. So we talked about basically applying rules for the actual logical operators in a query plan. But remember, also, there's the, the where clause, on, the on clause, having clauses. Right? Those are their, their, their own expression trees themselves. Right? Like something equals something, that's going to get vert, converted into an expression tree. And actually, maybe cases where we actually want to then apply optimizations on, on those expressions because we can do something more efficient. Right? So as, the, uh, as the, the sort of logical phase of the, optimization, uh, the, the optimizer is traversing the query plan, um, it can also then look inside of the, 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 the scans and the joins and whatever else has the expressions and then start traversing those trees and start figuring out if there's ways to optimize those. Where I showed the example before, we take the, the giant where clause and we break it up on the conjunctions. Right? As, we're, as we're doing that, we can also look at what the expressions are and figure out are there additional things that we, we can optimize inside that. Right? And this is implemented very similarly to the, the, the way I said we do logical optimization. Like you can have a bunch of if then else clauses in, in your in your when you evaluate the expression tree, or you can have a pattern matching rule engine again with priorities to say, actually I mean priorities don't matter for this as much, but it's basically you can declare these rules and they get, they get applied. Uh, they declare the rules to say if I look for this pattern and it matches, then apply this optimization, right? And typically you just do this until you, you don't have you don't have any more rules to match. All right, so let's look at an obvious example, right? So we want to remove unnecessary predicates. So a query shows up. Someone says where 1 equals 0. Uh, this is obviously going to be false. So we want our query optimizer to be able to identify, hey, this is stupid. Let's just rewrite this as a false. Right? And you say, that, well, like, this is super stupid. Why would you ever run, write a query like this? You'd be surprised. They exist. Um, but if you use where false, why can't I just optimize it again? Is there nothing? So the statement is, if you, use, if you, if you re rewrite it to false, why can't you just optimize to do nothing? Yes, some systems do that, not all of them. We'll see an example in a second. But why won't you do that? Why would you do what? Why won't you do that? Like, why won't you just optimize it with nothing? Why wouldn't you do that? 
because because not this one's obvious. One equals zero, right? right. Don't I, I don't need deep logic for that. Like, here's more complicated ones. Now equals null. Now's the current timestamp. Mm. But it better it, not be null. huh? That better not be it better null. not be null. Uh, and for for Postgres MySQL, they they get this right. They would write this as false. Uh, but SQLite doesn't, huh. right? Because think about it. Again, we're doing logical optimizations. Like we don't know what this this is actually going to produce at this point. You could, but assume they, they didn't implement it that way. You could look. Like, you'd have to have additional metadata to say, I know what the function this built-in function is. Could it ever return null? And if they don't have that metadata, then you don't know. Yeah, aren't all SQL functions strongly typed based on what the input types are? His, his statement is: Aren't all SQL functions strongly typed based on what their input inputs are? Yes. Like, like, Uh, again, it depends on the implementation of whether they maintain that in their catalog about their functions. I mean, what do, what do you want to tell you? <laughs> what? You like you, you huffed at me. You're like, no, no, no. Why, why do companies not do that? That's that's dumb. Could, uh, sure, it's dumb, but there's a lot, there's so many other things you got to do. I don't know, right? Oh, sorry. So here's another one. Uh, well, random is null. So uh, my SQL gets this gets this one right. Postgres does not. Right? So let's look, look quick example here. All right, so here's Postgres. So here's the, um, so we're going to run explain analyze. Again, this is that same uh, table we showed before, this 10 million uh, decimal numbers. Right? So you, now for one equals zero, Postgres flags, uh, I can't highlight, sorry. You got Postgres flags it as a one time filter. And it actually doesn't scan anything. So they recognize that one, equals, one cannot equal zero. So they basically evaluated the predicate once, saw that it's false, and therefore every tuple in the table is never going to, you know, it's never going to evaluate to true. So it doesn't actually do the scan, right? And it, and it dumps out right away. Let's try now where, uh, where now is null. So it also applied the one time filter, uh, saw that now is null. Uh, but it still set things up to actually see whether I actually want to scan this. So my first example, are one equals zero. I don't think it even got to, like, to actually run the query and say, okay, should I actually try to run this? It applied the filter or evaluated the predicate in the optimizer and saw that it's where equals false, and so it stops right there. In this case here, it didn't know in the optimizer that, that now is null, so I think it applied it, uh, and then it kicks out that it actually never executed. Right again, this is explain analyze. So this is what it actually did. If you replace it to just explain, I think it'll say that I, I, it does want to do it. Yeah, so here's, here's, what, here's, a, here's a clean analysis. So it didn't actually run the query, but it thinks it's, it's going to do this sequential scan, and it knows it needs to look at this, this once. All right? All right, last one. Where random is null. Should be exactly the same, right? Nope. It actually scanned, uh, where are we here? Yeah, d did a sequential scan on, uh, on the entire table and applied the filter for every single one and removed 10 million rows. Cool. Right? So in this case here, it doesn't know that random could, could not produce, is, is not going to produce uh, null, so it ran that every single time. So what's stopping me from just going to like, uh, the, re like the open source project and like putting a make a pull request right now? His statement is, question is, what's stopping you from going to, to GitHub or whatever? I don't think Postgres uses GitHub. Uh, and going and make a pull request to fix it? Nothing. Do it. I, I think you'll find it's not as easy as you think it is. Yes, in the back. What happens if this is not like another metric where you put it down something like uh, the random is null? And then you have to scan outside. So did you optimize the inner part? Uh, so your question is, so your question is like, what if I have a, an inner query uh, that the select is null, and then and that, that's in the, the from clause? Yeah, and then you have like the complete sequential scan outside. Is it able to optimize the inner part and realize that it's false? And then it the outside part? Uh, so there are, um, his statement is, question is like, could you also do, it's basically, can you do this short circuiting? Can you identify that like the inner query is never going to produce a result, therefore I don't need to run anything in the outer query? Again, for some cases, yes, some cases, no. All right, let's look at MySQL. 
Um, so let's do the, the, the 1 equals 0. Um, you see right here it says that there's an impossible where. So MySQL recognizes that I, I, I don't need to run this query at all because it's never going to produce a result. Let's try random is null. Of course, MySQL likes to be different, so they don't have random. It's got to be rand. They also recognize that they have an impossible where, right? And then for uh, now is null. They got that one too. So MySQL gets, gets this one right. Postgres does not. All right? All right. Yes? So your question is, if I have a where clause and there's no transformation I can do to convert it to like a false, does that mean for every single tuple I have to apply that predicate? Well, yes, because otherwise the, the, the query would produce an incorrect result. Now, the order in which you want to apply them, that depends on the optimizer. It can figure out what, what, when to do that. All right, you can also do uh, things like merging predicates. So we, here we have a... A where clause with, uh, with a disjunction, so val equals uh, values between 1 and 100, and value is between 50 and 150. And obviously, these are, um, you know, these are since they have a disjunction here, the range is actually expanded, so it's actually from 1 to 150. So some systems can recognize this and understand that, oh, like what the between clause is actually asking, understand that these are the ranges and that they can be merged. Um, so something like this. Not all systems can do this, but some can. Yes? Does SQL have like unspecified behaviors like C++ where they need to optimize? Uh, his question is, does, C++, uh, sorry, does SQL have undefined behaviors that, you, that can be optimized? Or what, what, say it again. Like C++ has like a lot of undefined behaviors that it can, anything, like you can assume this doesn't happen and you can, like, if you, I mean, you can do whatever you want, so the compiler can usually do. And this will come up when we talk about transactions. There'll be, like, this, the SQL standard will say something, like, say, oh, this is what you should do. This is what it means. But depending on the implementation, it may actually not be able to do that, or it might do something slightly different. There are, there are dark corners with unbehind, undefined behavior. Yes. We can ignore that for this class. All right. So, so far we have seen how to do rules to, again, to traverse the, query, the logical query plan and transform it to, to a new query plan. Uh, and then for uh, and then for expressions, same thing. We traverse the trees, uh, and we we can do manipulation of those. In some cases, we can evaluate them to see whether they're um, they're uh, you know, true or false. We condensed, or we, we can do additional rewriting. And there's a bunch of other optimizations you can you can do as well for 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 nested queries uh, that are similar. All right, so now let's talk about how we actually use cost-based search to find a uh, a better plan. So I would say that a lot of systems are going to do a combination of the two of these, as I said. So you'll do the, the rule stuff first, clean things up, uh, remove some things you know are never, never going to be useful, and then you apply the cost-based search. And oftentimes, they'll just do the cost-based search just for uh, the join ordering, right, to figure out what, order, like, what should be the outer table versus the inner table. Right? Some systems like SQL Server and, and CockroachDB, they're doing cost-based search that's more holistic for all, all is possible, both the logical and the physical manipulations or transformations. All right, so again, the, the cost model is going to allow us to predict the behavior of, of, a, of, a, of a query plan given a, a, a particular database state. And as I said, this is an internal cost that we can't map out to something to the, to the real world. Uh, there is research on how to predict the, like, the real runtime of a query plan based on what the optimizer thinks is going to happen. Uh, but most systems won't, won't do this. Or it's something that humans can look at. Internally, they have their own, their own, uh, their own range of values for a, a for you know, query costs. The reason why I have to do this is because it's going to be too expensive to run every possible query plan, right? So we need a way to, to quickly approximate, here's what this particular query plan is actually going to do, right? We, we want to do this in the order of, of milliseconds, right? If I have a billion tuples and a query might take a minute, I don't actually want to try to try out every single query plan that I could look at because it would be super slow. Um, now, I will say MongoDB actually does it this way. Uh, they actually generate all possible query plans, fire them all off, and then see what comes back first. And that's what they use to, uh, that's how basically their query optimizer works, which is pretty clever. 
Um, but you can do that for simple things. For more complex joins, I, I don't think that, that's a bad idea. All right, so our cost model, it can be comprised of a bunch of different things. So we'll have like the physical costs, like how much CPU we're going to consume, uh, how, much, how much disk reads and writes we're going to perform, whether the, the, the data we need is going to be in our buffer pool or not, uh, how, much, how, much memory, or how many network messages we have to send around, right? And this obviously can depend heavily on the, the performance of the hardware, right? If you have a really fast SSD, then maybe spilling the disk for some query plan versus another isn't that big of a deal. But if you have to write over the network that's far away, then maybe you want to choose a query plan that, that reduces the, the number of uh, disk writes. There's the logical costs. Uh, and these would be things like the, the number of tuples I'm going to spit out from my operator. And this obviously would be independent of the, of the actual the, 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 the physical, you know, the physical choice or the physical operator I would use. Like if I do a join between two tables with some predicate, it's always going to produce the same number of tuples, regardless of whether it's a sort merge join versus a hash join. And then those algorithmic costs that you can sort of bake in and say, I, I know that you know, my big O notation of this, this join algorithm is, is, is this versus that versus another one. And you can choose one over another. Typically, it's going to be a combination of, of, the, of the first two. I don't know which ones. I, I, I haven't seen outside academia anybody that does number three. So quickly, so what Postgres does, just because again, the source code is, is, is readily available, and the documentation is actually pretty good. So for their execution, uh, their cost model is going to be a combination of the, the physical costs in terms of the CPU and I.O. that the operator is going to consume. And what they're going to do is they're going to weight the, uh, these, these, these expected uh, cost components, like how much, how much disk I'm, I'm going to read and write, by some magic constant factor that you can define as an administrator. And the idea here is basically to identify that whether we're going to be, be able to process this query or tuples in an operator entirely in memory, or we have to get it from disk. And if we're getting from disk, is it a random read versus a sequential read? Right? And so by default, they're going to assume that if it's in memory, it's 400 times faster to, to do some, to process that tuple than having to read it from disk. And then, then it's going to say the sequential I.O. is going to be 4x faster than reading it from uh, doing to random I.O. Random I.O. Right? So if you go look at the documentation about these, these, the, the, these different uh, constant uh, weights you can set, right? they have default values. There's this little line here that basically says, hey, there's no really good way to figure out the ideal settings for these values. Right? And that you can assume that they're, they're good enough, but they're basically recommending you have to do trial and error to figure out what's the right way to set these things. Uh, but most people don't, don't set them. And again, the, the different database systems, some systems, like the commercial guys like DB2, when you turn the system on, they basically run a bunch of uh, micro benchmarks to figure out how fast your disk is, how fast your CPU is. And they use that to derive the constant factors that would use in your cost model. Right? If, you ever, like, when, if you use Linux, right, when Linux boots up, there's that thing called BOGO MIPS where it basically tries to figure out how fast your CPU is. It's, a, it's the same idea. So his statement is, is this because um, do those systems like Oracle or DB2, because they're being sold as appliances, meaning they, they have exact control of the hardware, therefore they know how to set these values? Yeah. But it, it, yeah, yes, but they still have these kind of flags that you can set yourself if you want to. But why would your own settings be better than theirs? Same as why would your own settings be better than theirs? Um, Because maybe, again, like, so there's the micro benchmarks. Like, that's, that's different, right? That's like trying to compute it exactly in the hardware. For, uh, for like, general purpose things, like, it's trying to be, like, the lowest common denominator. Like, so, like some, some settings that are, like, good enough for most, most people, right? But obviously, if you have a very specific use case, like, you're super heavy on rights in a very specific way, maybe you want to set these things differently. Yes? So his statement is, uh, I want to take this offline, but the like, statement is like, do the high-end enterprise databases, do they, do they fab their own hardware, basically sell them as appliances? We saw this when the database machines. Yes, you can buy million-dollar boxes from Oracle and Teradata and IBM. So they're not just a software company. They're like a software company. Uh, I mean, like, they're not, so his statement is, are they not just a soft, software company? Uh, they make most of the money on software. 
All right, so the way we're going to actually generate this cost model is through these, these internal statistics that the data system is going to maintain about, the, uh, about, about your tables and indexes and other things, right? And how the different systems are going to calculate these statistics when they actually do it depends on, um, uh, you know, depends on the implementation. Sometimes they have triggers to say, if I, if, you know, if I, if I inserted 20, if the size of my table has changed by 20% or I updated 20% of the tuples, then rerun, analyze, and, and, and compute my statistics. Right? Well, Oracle has a cron job. They run this every night at like 11 p.m. Like, there's a bunch of different ways to do these things. These are basically the, the commands uh, if you wanted to run these, these, these manually. And just think of those, there are sequential scans that are going to look at the tuples or look, look at in a table that compute some approximation of what's inside that, that table. Uh, this is a mistake. That, I, should, I should have deleted the slide. Ignore this. Sorry. All right, so let's do a really, really simple example of how we have to compute the selectivity of a predicate. Uh, and to keep it really simple, assume that it's, it's a, a value equals something, like a quality predicate, right? So we'd say the selectivity of a predicate P is going to be a fraction of the tuples in our table that will qualify or, or evaluate to true for this, uh, for this predicate, right? So for an equality predicate, it's just the number of occurrences of the value we're trying to look up on divided by the total number of tuples in our, in our table. Right, so, so for select star from people where age equals nine, assume you have some kind of distribution like this, where you have the number of occurrences and then the distinct values of the given attribute age. So to compute this, uh, the predicate, the selectivity of age equals nine, we just go look up in this, in this histogram uh, where, where nine is, get the count, uh, and then it's four over divided by 45, assuming there's 45 tuples. That's basically what the, the data system is going to be doing for all different possible predicates you can have. This is the best case scenario. Something, you know, something equals something. Uh, you know, if we have this distribution, then, then we can figure that out. Where things go, uh, negations is the inverse of this. Where things get hard is when you have uh, inequalities, like less than, greater than, uh, like clauses, and other more complicated things. But we, we can ignore all that for now. So there's three big assumptions we're going to do to simplify our calculations of selectivities. Uh, and these are sort of, again, if you're building a cost-based optimizer, these are the sort of first assumptions you would make because it makes the math a lot easier, makes the implementation a lot easier. The more complicated systems are, are more sophisticated in how they, on how they do these cardinality ca calculations and don't make, always make these assumptions. So. The, a really simple assumption you can do is assume that there's uniform data, that the, all the values are going to occur equally uh, the same amount of times. And obviously, in a real world, we know that's not true. Um, but the way you can get around this is that you can maintain what is called a heavy hitter list, or like exact counts for just the, the ten most common uh, or the ten, the ten most repeated values in a, in, a, in a column, and then you assume every, everybody else has the same uh, same occurrence. We're also going to assume that our predicates are independent. Right, that we can evaluate them. Um, uh, you split up a, uh, a where clause by, by conjunctions and evaluate them individually. And if you multiply them, uh, then you get the true selectivity. Right? It's, it's sort of basic in statistics. And then the inclusion principle basically says that, uh, that for every tuple that's in the inner table when we do a join, it's guaranteed there'll be a, a tuple in the outer table. Right? If you have a foreign key, then that, 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 that's going to be true. But not, a lot of times, people don't find foreign keys, or they're doing joins on things that aren't foreign keys. Right? So again, this is like, this is like, if, like if you're building a cost model for the very first time, you would do something like this. But things, you know, this is obviously not correct in most real world scenarios. Because you can have correlations between, between attributes and statistics. So let's consider a really simple example here. We have a, a table of a bunch of cards, and we're to keep track of the make and the model, right? And so we have a query, select star from, from the table, where make equals Honda and model equals Accord. If we assume our independence, uh, same independence assumption and uniformity assumption, then we would break up this predicate by the, by, by the conjunction and say, what's the, what's the selectivity of the make equals Honda, and what's the selectivity of model equals Accord? Multiply them those two together, and then you get the true, you get the expected selectivity of this predicate. But this is stupid because there's only one car company that makes makes an Accord, right? It's Honda. So these are correlated. Like if you know a model is Accord, 
then you know the car maker is, is, is a Honda, right? So the real, the real selectivity is one over 100, not you know, one over 10 times one over 100. So in the, again, the high-end systems, they can actually, you can actually define, say, these, these columns are correlated, and the, the, the data system will maintain statistics for the combination of the two of them together rather than having them uh, be individual. So this is kind of sort of like a, a brain dump for you guys. They're showing here's all the things that, that you have to do. Here's why things can get, get are really hard. Uh, and hopefully you just you have better appreciation of how tricky this actually is and why people pay a lot of money for it. So there's three ways we can maintain statistics. Uh, again, we, don't, we can't scan the entire table to say what's the selectivity of a predicate because if, if we're doing that, we might as well just be able to just run the query anyway, right? Yes. So his question is, um, his question is, does the data system maintain these statistics automatically? Uh, and the answer, to answer to that is yes, except for the correlated statistics. You have to tell it what, which attributes are correlated, what columns are correlated. Um, it will maintain these things automatically. There, we'll see how to wait to, to reduce the size of them, right? Because you don't, you don't actually restore the count for every single unique value because they'd be huge. But there's ways to reduce this, compress down the size of, of the metadata or the statistics you're storing. The real question is not whether you, you should you maintain them, it's how often you refresh them, right? And again, they, you can do this manually, or you, you can set like parameters to say how aggressive are you at like refreshing statistics. Because again, it's basically like running another query. So if, it's, if, it's, if you're, re if you're recomputing your statistics on a one petabyte database every, every minute, then that's going to interfere with all your other queries and slow you down. So the question is, is whether you, you, you should do it, it's how often you do it. Another good rule of thumb is like if you bulk load a bunch of data, like a lot of times people have like jobs where like at midnight they insert a bunch of rows. Immediately after you do that, then you want to run analyze or refresh your statistics. All right, I'll go through these quickly. There's basically three ways to store these things, histograms, sketches, and sampling. Um, histograms we've already seen. Uh, the, the problem is if we store a histogram count for every single, uh, for every single key or every single value in a column, it's going to be super expensive. So my, my rinky-dink example here has 15, 15, 15 values, uh, and I'm sorting a 30-bit count for them. It's only 60 bytes. But if I have a billion values in, my, in, in just one column, then that's going to be 4 gigabytes of just storing statistics. So no system would actually store this. Um, oops, sorry. No system would actually store the exact count for all of these. And so, sorry, that last slide should have been skipped. What you said I want to do is bucket up the values uh, and based on some, some kind of, uh, based on some threshold or some rule, and then now store the count for all the values within that bucket. Right, so it's a simple way to, to aggregate things in there and compress them. So an echolith histogram is basically, you should define a bucket that has uh, n number of, of values and every bucket you would have would have the same count. So now your histogram just stores between ra the range one for values one to three, here's the count, four to six, here's the count. Right, then you wanna say, if you wanna say how many, wh what's the number of occurrences for key two, you would take whatever this count is divided by the number of keys in your bucket. It'll get it wrong, right, because it's not an exact lookup, but in some cases that's good enough. Another one you can do is also equidepth. And the idea here is that you want the, you have the, the, the width of the bucket, the size of the bucket is going to vary so that the total number of, of the number of occurrences within each bucket is the same across buckets. Right, so I would go something like this because I'm trying to reach the count of the number of occurrences to be 12 and I would store, store it like that. Right, and there's just different statistical trade-offs to say whether one, one scenario is better than another. In this case here, we're, we're doing quantas. Sketches are sort of similar to like a, like a balloon filter. These are like probabilistic data structures that can give you approximate counts in some scenarios. Uh, and then the idea is like a histogram. You, you remove some of the histograms and replace it with one of these, these sketches. Uh, they're much smaller and they give you potentially better bounds and, uh, on, your, on your estimations. So count min sketch is, is the older one from the 80s. The hyperlog log shows up in a bunch of newer systems. But again, you can only use it to say, what's the number, like for a very specific question, like what's the number of distinct elements in my set? 
but you can't say what's the number of occurrences of, of a particular key. The, the, the countman sketch can give you that. All right, and the last one is sampling. All right, this one seems sort of obvious, but not every system does this. So as you're doing run analyze, uh, you also maintain a sort of separate sort of in internal table on the side that has a subset of the tuples that are in your, in your table. And then now in your, in, your, in, your, in your optimizer, when you want to say what's the expected selectivity of a predicate, you actually just go run that, that predicate on the sample table and produce the result. And you assume that the sample is representative of what's the entire data set. So say I have a billion tuples, but I just sample three tuples out like this. So now if I want to say what's the selectivity of age equals greater than 50. Uh, I can just apply the, the, just scan through this. Ideally, it's going to sit in memory. And then you, then you get an expected selectivity like that. And you assume that's going to match to what, whatever is in the full table. So SQL Server does this, um, and I think DB2. Most, most systems do not, do not do this. Right? Sometimes other systems, you can go maybe grab a random block or random page in a table, then apply the, the predicate, see whether that matches, and assume that the rest look like that. Um, but obviously, there's, there's pros and cons to, 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 for that, right? It won't be, maybe it's not fully representative, but it would be faster and easier to, to implement. All right, so that's the cost model. So now that we can roughly estimate the selectivity of our predicates, uh, and we can roughly figure out what's the, maybe the expected number of tuples that are coming out of our, of our operator, what do we actually got to do with this now? So now we get to the cost-based search, right? And so after we do all our rules, uh, then we want to start enumerating over a bunch of different plans and try to figure out or estimate what their cost is. And then we want to pick whatever the best plan we've seen during the amount of time that we're allowed to do the search. Right? Because it's MP complete to do this, we can't do an exhaustive search. So there's basically a bunch of uh, parameters you can specify in, in these systems or these optimizers and say how long you're allowed to do the search for. Right? If my query is going to run for one millisecond, but I'm going to search for 100 milliseconds, that's not a good trade-off. Right? So we'll see how to do single relations, and then the, which are easy. Uh, it's the multiple relations. We'll see that. Um, that's, that's the harder one. And then nested subqueries, we basically saw if we can rewrite that into joins, then it's, then it's essentially a multiple relation uh, query. Right? So single relations is pretty easy. Right? We know we're scanning one table or accessing one table. So we're just going to pick what the, first, the best access method is. Um, and we can use our cost model to say what's the expected cost of these different choices. Index scan probably is, is if, you have a, if you have the right index, it's probably always going to be the right, right choice. Actually, depends on depends on the where clause. Um, and, uh, and then you just, uh, then you maybe try to determine when, what order you want to apply the predicates. Because uh, you split them up, you can, you can move them around as needed. Um, for OLTB queries, these are often very easy to do, especially if they're equality predicates. Because you know exactly what the best index is going to be, because you, you you could look in the catalog. So these are called searchable queries, search argument able. It's some some term from the 70s. The basic idea is that you know uh, immediately what's the best index uh, to choose for this for this query, and you just pick that, and everything else sort of falls into place. So again, you can use the cost model to say what's the expected number of tuples that are returned from from an index for a given predicate and then pick the one that's going to uh, filter out the most things. Right? So in this case here, this, this is the easiest, the easiest thing to do. I have, I have a, a table on people. ID is the primary key. So I just look at the catalog and say, this is, since I know the primary key is unique, it's an equality predicate, I know immediately that this, this is the index. Or the, the index and the primary key is what I want to use for this. But I could have multiple indexes that have different choices, like ID, ID column plus the value column together. And you use the cost model to identify that this thing is is, is better. All right, for multiple relations, there's two choices. There's the bottom-up optimization and top-down. So most systems are going to be doing uh, bottom-up. Uh, it's going to be a combination of the, they, again, do the rules, the rewriting stuff we talked about before, and then you do the bottom-up optimization just for the join, to figure out the join orders. Postgres then also does additional rule-based optimization to clean things up after you do the, the bottom-up search. Um, the top-down uh, methods typically try to be, again, all-inclusive. They, they do all the transformations all at once, um, which to me seems cleaner, but most people implement the first one. 
So let's go to these one by one. So for bottom up, again, we're going to use the static rules to perform our initial optimization we talked about before. And then we use a dynamic programming technique, uh, essentially like a divide and conquer, to start with the um, just the unoptimized, just the, the, the sort of the raw relations. And then we're going to iterate through and apply uh, evaluate different join orderings uh, for the first, you know, for the, say you're doing three tables, for the first two tables and, the, and your different combinations of those. Then we do the three-way join above that for the, for the remaining table, and then we, then we produce our final result. I'll show what I mean by, uh, by this visually. But this was the, how they implemented the first query optimizer that did cost-based search back in the 1970s at System R. And then pretty much this is what the textbook, I think, describes as well. Like, the high-level idea is, is still basically the same. But this was the first cost-based optimizer uh, that, that existed for, for, for a database system. Um, but uh, this carries over to DB2, and as I said, most of the open source, open source systems, if they have a cost-based search, this is, this is what they're going to do. So in System R, what they're going to do is uh, gonna break the query up the blocks, as we talked about before, and, and to handle and then convert all the, to do all the logical operator optimizations that we talked about. And then for the each logical operator exists, they're going to then try to figure out what are the physical operators that could possibly implement that logical operator. Uh, and to simplify things, they're only going to consider the join algorithms and access paths, things like aggregations and stuff like that. You, you basically use heuristics to pick those. And then they're going to iteratively construct a left deep join tree uh, that has the lowest cost. So this is one of the big optimizations or big assumptions that they made back in the 1970s. It still carries over today. Some systems don't actually do this anymore, but they made this choice that like a right deep tree was always that was always the best way to actually implement a, a, a query with joins, and therefore I don't consider bushy trees where like it's you join two tables over here and two tables over here and then join those together. It's always joining two tables going up on one side of the tree, and then you just throw away any right deep trees as well because they're just the, the you know the they're symmetrical to the left deep. So this is an example of a of a you know a rule in how you do your query optimizer where you can throw away a bunch of things you're not going to consider because it, it, it reduces the search time. Again, think 1970s, super slow computers. This was super, this was important for them. So this is the same query we had before. We're going to get all the artists that appear on my mixtape, uh, but now we're going to add an order by clause at the end. We're going to order by them by artist ID. So in step one, they're going to take uh, choose the best access paths for each table. Again, this is just rules, right? So we say for artists, a sequential scan appears a sequential scan, and the album I have an index I can look up on name. Then I'm going to enumerate all possible orderings for the table, so just all possible combinations of joining the three tables in any different order, uh, and they're going to consider both the the both like a, uh, inner joins as well as Cartesian products, but it, in, in actuality they would immediately throw away the Cartesian products because again we know we don't want to do that. And then for all these different combinations of the join ordering, now I'm going to do this dynamic search or dy use dynamic programming to figure out. What's the, what's the joint order that, that produces uh, the query plan at the lowest cost? So again, some bottom-up approach, you have sort of the bottom part is where you start. You just have your three tables. And then the top will be the three tables joined together in a particular order, right? And so, I sorry, not, sorry, the top is not in a particular order. It just says that they've been joined. So in the first phase, what you're going to do is say, I'm going to pick any two tables to join together. And then also cho choose an algorithm for them. So in this case here, I can join artists and peers. This one joins album and appears. And that one over there jo joins appears and album. I think it is going off for all of their other combinations, but I didn't want to draw that in PowerPoint. And then the path into this next logical operator here will have the different physical operators. So I can either do a hash join or a sort merge join and do the same thing for all of those. And so for each of these, I can then use my cost model and say, what's the ex execution cost for this physical operator to do the join on, on these two tables? And then I'll throw away, throw away all of them that and sort of going up from to the next logical node, throw away the one except everyone but the one that has the, the, the lowest cost. Right? Then do the same thing. For each of these logical operators, uh, figure out the different uh, physical operators to get me up to the, the three-way join up above. Find the one that has the lowest cost, uh, throw away all the others. And now then I look, go back, you backtrack and figure out which path down to the, the bottom has the lowest cost. And you would choose this one here. 
Is this clear? Yes. Why do you have this computer both Elvin, uh, Elvin joint up here and also up here joint Elvin? Can you always join it with the smaller cable at the other? So, so your question is like, so at this point here, why do I, why do I consider these different combinations? Yeah. Right. So, so like, so the physical operator says this is joining. A two is the outer. A three is the inner. This is A three is the outer. A two is the inner. Yeah, but don't you always want the smaller table to be upper? Yeah, you you want the smaller table to be the outer table, but at this like, until you look at the cost model, you don't know. The cost model will figure that out. Yeah. So say it again. Uh, your statement is this, this should have been an artist album. I mean, the dot, 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 the ellipsis means like it goes off. There's more. But it's all unique combinations of like appears artist, artist appears, right? Because outer versus inner. Okay, again, so then we have all these different paths. We just pick the one with the lowest cost. Yes? Why is the left deep tree? The question is why is the left deep tree considered optimal? Um, it's not optimal. There could be a bushy plan that does uh, produce better results. Yeah, I don't have slides with this. So say I want to join A1, A2, A3. A left deep join would be like A1, A2, and then A3, right? So like I'm going up the left, left side of the tree. Uh, let me throw an A4. All right, so then if you had also then another join here, right, you just go up the left side. That's, that's a left deep join. I hate chalk. It's so gross. Um, a bushy plan would be A1, A2, join that, A3, A4, join that. Join that. That's a bushy plan, right? So there are some cases where this is actually better. Back in the day, in the 70s, since they had so much limited like memory, that they wanted to do as much pipelining as possible. So if you if you only do left deep trees, then I can sort of again have pipelines go up as far as I can, keep things in memory. In this case here, if I do a bushy plan, I got to run this join, materialize results. Then run this join, you know, materialize results, and then possibly bring that back into memory. Got to go back to disk and get it, right? So back in the day, they wanted to avoid that. Some systems maintain that still that that can apply the same trick uh, as as system R, but I, I think for modern hardware, it's not needed anymore. Okay. Well, the last thing to point out too is like in in system R in the original implementation. They had no notion of the logical or the, so the, the physical properties of the, the data that each operator is producing. So even though my query had an order by, uh, there's nothing in these in sort of how they would represent the query plan to say, oh yeah, the, the data is coming out of this operator in this sorted order. So the way they would they would handle that is in the cost model, you would you would uh, well, you'd basically have to reintroduce uh, an order by clause somewhere or order sorting operator, and then had the cost model recognize that, that that was more expensive to do. But there's, there's, there's nothing as there, in, in the original implementation of System R's optimizer that could keep track of how the data is coming out of it. And only after you produce the best plan, then you go patch it up. Yes. The statement is the limitation of system R here was that they uh, didn't have a notion of sort order, so therefore they couldn't recognize that like a sort merge join would have been better than a than a hash join. Yeah, that's what I'm, yes. the newer systems they maintain additional metadata, but we'll see how I do it in the top down approach. All right, so the top down approach is this guy Gertz Graphy again keeps showing up again the volcano model, uh, the B plus G book. Um, 
he had a system also called Volcano. That's where the Volcano Iter model comes from. Um, but he had a series of papers in the, in the 1990s that said, here's how to build a top down. Yes? Yeah, so her statement, her statement is, and I, I, I mentioned this before, like, if we're doing this MP complete search, isn't the, the, the search can take longer than the query if you run, let it run forever. So there's usually a timeout to say, if I, if I run for more than this amount of milliseconds, stop. Or like, if I don't see a better plan after so many milliseconds or seconds, stop. You have to have, you have, to have, a, you have a cutoff. Yes. All right, so I'm going to quickly go through this. Again, it's a different way to think about how to do query optimization. And as I said, this is what SQL Server does. I, I'll post a link on Slack. They gave a talk with us at CMU, I think, during the pandemic two years ago. It describes their query optimizer. Hands down, it's the best talk I've ever seen in my life, uh, query optimization. And what they do is super, super sophisticated. They have the best query optimizer. I'm not saying this because, whatever, because I like Microsoft, whatever. Uh, like, the research shows that their query optimizer does better than all the other ones. Uh, they do the sampling technique I talked about. They do this, this top-down approach. Uh, it's very, very fascinating, and I think it's, it's, this is state-of-the-art. Um, but it's not to say that it's state-of-the-art because it's doing top-down. Uh, you know, there's other state-of-the-art systems, like the DB2 one's pretty good, too, as well. Like, Cockroach, well, Cockroach is also top-down, but, like, again, this is, a, like, they've been doing this. Microsoft basically hired Gertz Graphy in the 90s and said, rebuild our query optimizer. They paid millions and millions and millions of dollars to do this with a big, big team, and, and it shows. Like, their query optimizer is phenomenal. Postgres, as much as I love it, it just doesn't have those resources. So it's, it's nowhere near as sophisticated as, as what SQL Server can do. So let me show you what top-down looks like. So with top-down, you start at the top and say, well, what I want my result to be, what I want my query plan to look like. And in this case here, we are also going to introduce this, these, these property uh, values to say what we want the data to look like. So we want to join on artist appears an album, and then we want the data to be sorted on artist ID. So then now what we're going to do is we're going to do conversions of both from logical to logical and logical to physical plans. Um, and so we can sort of enumerate a bunch of different choices down here. Right? Here's the, you can do these two joins here. Uh, and then we can do, um, do our scans. Right? So here we can join, uh, we, we sort of go one tick below and say, okay, if I, do a, a, if I can convert this join above to a certain merge join on these two tables, the two tables I've already joined, uh, then uh, if, it's, if, if the, the, the operator I'm looking at, if the current cost of the query plan is still less than the best cost I've seen so far, then I'm allowed to keep going down in the tree. It's like a branch and bound search. As soon as I, I have an intermediate result in my query tree that I know is, is worse than the, the best plan I've seen so far, then I can stop and I don't need to go further down of the tree. Right? So in this case here, I'm allowed to go here, and then I try uh, then I look how to join, uh, to take the join of the Join the result of this join plus the, 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 the scan table here. That looks good. So now I go down and say, how am I going to do this join? I consider a hash join. Look at the cost there. Look at different access methods for get this data in. I go back up and say, all right, let me also consider the sort merge join. Same thing. I go down here and say, what's the different ways to get the scan this data in? Right? So I can do transformations both logical to logical and logical to physical. Um, they also have this notion of enforcer rules that will require a sort of subtree in my query plan to produce the data in a certain way that I, that, that it, in a certain physical properties that I need to have in, in my, that point of the tree. So in this case here, at the, at, the, at the root of the query plan, I need my data to be sorted by artist ID uh, on the uh, ID on the art, ID on artist.id. So as I'm doing traversal, if I, if I then say, should I consider a hash join uh, is feeding into my, my, my root node here, the hash join will randomize all the data, right? So in this case here, it can't, the, the hash join would not be able to satisfy the enforcer rule that says the data must be sorted. So I know I can discard it and don't need to traverse down in the tree at all. I could also have now a, a quick sort, or you know, a sort operator here. And again, this is showing that the, I'm converting different logical operators to other new logical operators, other physical operators. It's not always going to be a one-to-one -one mapping. So in this case here, it is sorted. And so this, this operator does guarantee that the data is sorted. But now if I consider a hash join going to, into this, I would, I would recognize that, OK, this is already more expensive than the best plan I saw before, because I'm doing this, this additional quick sort. 
So therefore, I, can, I know this is not where I want to go down the tree and cut this off. This is a gross, gross simplification. There's obviously a lot of optimizations you can do to memoize things and speed things up, but we, we, we can ignore that for now. We will cover this more in the advanced class. I just want to get, again, the notion of like what is, what is bottom up versus top down, like what are the trade offs for these? Okay? Yes? But does it sort of like preview search? Like, so you make preview decision on each level? Uh, Kristen, is this like greedy search? Uh, yes, but there's, there's rules you apply to then. Uh, there's rules you can apply to, to can I say this? Yes, it's, it's greedy search. Let's keep it simple. Yeah, yes. There's a, like, you can do, not simulate kneeling, but there's, there's ways to like, okay, let me just jump to a random part in the tree and search from there to get out of like a local, local uh, minimum. We can ignore that. Okay, so <laughs> that's query optimization in, in an hour and 20 minutes. And as I said, it's the, most, it's the hardest part of databases. Uh, so again, I just want you to understand that like, when you call explain, you see these numbers. This is basically where it's getting those numbers. It's how it's generating the, the physical plan. So we saw how to use static rules and heuristics to optimize a query plan without understanding anything what's actually inside the database. It, not entirely true, because you, you need to know like basic counts and things like that and what the schema looks like. But we're not scanning the actual data. We're not trying to do approximation. And then if you want to do more advanced opt uh, optimizations, like the join order, because that's the most important one, we would use a cost model. Okay. So today's class was the, most, the hardest part of databases. The next class is the second hardest part, which is transactions. Uh, this part is my, this is my favorite topic. This is the one I actually do know, do know something about, uh, more than query optimization. So we'll cover the next, I think, two or three weeks, we'll cover transactions. And then it'll be uh, recovery and logging. And then that's it for, for basics for databases. And we go to distributed databases. OK? All right, guys. See ya. Super snake.